We've gotten to that part of the chapter where it is time to start reviewing for the test. Figure we will have uh, one day of review today and another day of review tomorrow. So lesson seven will be review. Lesson eight will be review. And then after that, uh, we'll have a test the following day. And so that should get us in good situation. So uh, if you have not finished the worksheet already, I um, highly recommend that you pause or stop the video, work on the worksheet. Uh, the video will actually show you step-by-step -step, uh, solutions to each one of the questions. And you can go as slowly through the video as you want, pausing or stopping or rewinding, or you can just let it play straight on through. But uh, you should find that uh, I explained everything pretty clearly step by step. Okay, question number one. We know that for any type of a polygon, if there are n sides, we have n minus 2 times 180 degrees for the total measurement. So if we're looking at a seven sided polygon, the sum of the interior angles will be 7 subtract 2 times 180 degrees. 7 subtract 2, of course, is 5. 5 times 180, might have to use a calculator on that one, comes out to be 900. So the answer for this question would be 900 degrees. Okay, what if we know the sum is 1,440 degrees? How many sides do we have? Well, of course, we're going to use the same equation. n minus 2 times 180 degrees will give us the sum. Whereas this time, instead of knowing the number of sides, we know the sum. We know the sum has to be 1,440 degrees. If you want, you could start by multiplying this out with the distributive property. I prefer to divide both sides by 180 degrees. Notice when I divide by 180 degrees, the degrees cancel out, right? Because n is just going to be the number of sides. It's not going to have anything to do with degrees. If need be, use the calculator there. Add two to each side you find out that we're dealing with a 10-sided polygon. In other words, we have a decagon. Quadrilateral. You probably remember that it has 360 degrees for the interior angles. If you didn't remember that, you can quickly figure it out. Say, hey, there are four sides. Four subtract two is two. 2 times 180 is 360. But I bet you remembered there's 360 degrees in a quadrilateral. Notice in my equation, I don't have the degree symbol, right? Because x is not going to be measured in degrees. So I have my four different angles. They have to add up to 360 degrees. I better combine like terms. 5x plus 3x made the 8x. I take my negative 5, my negative 1, my positive 160, my positive 150. Combine all those, I got 304. Subtract 304 from each side of the equation. So now I've got 8x equals 56. 
Divide both sides by 8. And again, come up with an answer of 7. So x is 7. Notice it's not 7 degrees. Right? x is just the number 7. Number 4, number 5, number 6. Let's get through these. Number 4 is probably quick and easy. Is said, hey, A has to be 6. B has to be 8. C has to be 50. D has to be 130. Oh, number 6 got to slow down a little bit. And now 2E minus 5 has to be the same as 3. Add 5 to each side. 3 plus 5 made 8. Divide each side by 2. And E is 4. 3 times F minus 10 has to be the same as 11. So I can add 10 to each side. 11 plus 10 is 21. Divide by 3, I get 7. You'll notice sometimes I, when I'm doing my step-by-step -step work, I show every possible step. Other times I'm doing some of the steps in my head, but I'm commenting as I go what I just did. Uh, do whatever you feel most comfortable with. Some of you like to show every single step, and that's fantastic. Number 7. Well, because the diagonals are bisected, I know 4G minus 7 has to equal 2G plus 3. Subtract 2G from each side. You'll notice I'm going back to showing all the detail. 2G minus 7 has to be 3. I'll add 7 to each side. 2G has to be 10. Divide both sides by 2. G has to be 5. Four H plus 1 has to be equal to H plus 13. Again, the diagonals bisect each other. Subtract H from each side. I now have 3H plus 1 is 13. Subtract 1 from each side. 3H is now equal to the number 12. Of course, I don't want 3Hs, right? I just want one of them. So I divide by 3. 12 divided by 3. Today will come out to be 4. I bet if you watch this again tomorrow, it'll still be 4. Number eight, okay, a parallelogram. Besides having the diagonals bisect each other, you also know that the opposite angles are congruent. And you also know that a pair of angles will add up to 180. So the 10x plus 11 plus 3x, since those are consecutive angles, that pair has to add up to 180 degrees. Combine like terms. Undo the addition. Now I've got 13 times x. To undo multiplication, we divide. And of course, when you get to 169 divided by 13, I'd expect that you've got your multiplication table memorized up through 12 times 12. 13 is obviously larger than 12. So I've got no problem if you want to reach for a calculator on that type of work. All right, 10 plus 3 is 13. You should be able to do that in your head. All right, but 169 divided by 13, most of us would grab a calculator. But wait, there's more. We've got to figure out y, and then we've got to figure out z. Well, again, with a parallelogram, since opposite angles are congruent, we know that 14y plus 1 degrees has to have the same measurement as 10x plus 11 degrees. Again, notice when I write the equation, I don't put the degrees in there because x was just a plain old number 13. 
just like y is going to be a plain old number it's not going to have degrees associated with it hmm that equation has two unknowns that's right we can substitute 13 for x now the equation just has one unknown number order of operations says we better do the 10 times 13 first then we can do the addition now we can undo the operations to isolate the variable y subtract one from each side divide each side by 14 ta-da y has a value of 10. now for z I think the easiest one is to compare it to the opposite angle. So I know that 7z minus 3 has to have the same measurement as 3x. Those measurements have to be equal because the angles they're associated with are congruent. Again, I know x has to be 13. 3 times 13 is just 39. Addition of 3 will undo the subtraction of 3. And since I don't want 7 times z, I just want z, the opposite of multiplication is division. Divide each side by 7. z is 6. Now when you get something like 42 divided by 7, that you should be able to do in your head. Right? If 42 divided by 7 makes you want to reach for a calculator, I suggest using some flashcards and getting that sped up a little bit. Number 9. Number 10. Hey, we're into a rhombus. So one of the special things about a rhombus is that we know the diagonals bisect the angles. So angle one must be 50 degrees. We also know with a rhombus, the diagonals are perpendicular. So measure of angle two has to be 90 degrees. And I've got a triangle. Angles one, two, and three are inside a triangle. So they must add up to 180 degrees. I can substitute 50 degrees for the measure of angle one, 90 degrees for the measure of angle two. Combine like terms, isolate the variable. Notice we are including the degree symbol, right? Instead of finding the value of a variable, which would just be a number, we're actually asked for the measurement of an angle, right? Measure of angle one is 50 degrees, right? We're not trying to find that like X equals seven or X equals 13. We're actually finding the measurement of the angle. So we are using the degree symbol there rectangle you know in a rectangle diagonals must be congruent and so the distance from b to u has to be equal to the distance from e to l because the diagonals have to be congruent and if they are congruent that means they have equal length same measurement i subtracted 5x from each side now, of course, I will subtract 13 from each side. Divide both sides by 2. I get an answer of 3. Again, I'm alternating with how I'm showing my work. Sometimes I'm showing the step-by-step -step where I actually show the addition or the subtraction or the division. But also notice that I never jump more than one step ahead. So if I decide to, for example, subtract 5x from each side, after I do that, I write the new equation. I don't do two steps or three steps before I write an equation. Every time I do one step, I write the new equation. Of course, we weren't asked to find x. We were asked to find the length of the diagonal. 7 times 3 is 21. 21 plus 13 makes 34. We better find the length of the other diagonal. 
I wonder what it's going to be. Let me see. 5 times x will become 5 times 3. 5 times 3 is 15. 15 plus 19 is 34. What a coincidence. Oh, wait. That's not a coincidence. They have to match. Diagonals of a rectangle are congruent. So if one of the diagonals has a length of 34, the other one has to have a length of 34. Number 11 and number 12, these look pretty quick. Because it's a trapezoid that happens to be isosceles, right? That's what the tick marks on BS and AT tell us. Right, the little arrowheads on BA and ST tell us it's a trapezoid because there's exactly one pair of parallel sides, plus the directions told us it's a trapezoid. But we know it's isosceles because of those tick marks. So measure of angle T has to match measure of angle S. And then, of course, I know the four angles must add up to 360 degrees. But I know that angle A and angle B are congruent. So therefore, the measurement of angle A, I can trade for the measurement of angle B. And of course, I know the measure of angle T is 82 degrees. The measure of angle S is 82 degrees. I can substitute those in. It looks like one of those 82 should have been in purple and I didn't do that. Combine like terms, I now have two of those measure of angle Bs plus 164 degrees equals 360 degrees. Again, notice the degree symbols going through here because we're actually finding the measurement of an angle, not the value of a variable. I subtract 164 degrees from each side of the equation. I divide each side by two. I now know the measure of angle B is 98 degrees. Therefore, the measure of angle A is also 98 degrees. Mid-segment of a trapezoid. Again, this does not have to be an isosceles trapezoid. Mid-segment will work whether or not it's isosceles. We know it's a mid-segment because, one, the directions tell us it's a mid-segment. But if we didn't have that in the directions, looking at the diagram, we can see that point M bisects one of the legs. Point N bisects the other leg. So sure enough, those are both midpoints, so it's a mid-segment. And to find the mid-segment, we just average the bases. 22 plus 18 is 40. Divide by 2, we get 20. So the length of segment MN has to be 20. 13, we're looking for a value of x. Again, for the mid-segment, I know I just average the bases. Of course, the mid-segment is actually 3x plus 1. I can substitute that in. Now I can average the bases. 8 plus 42 is 50. 50 divided by 2 is 25. Subtract 1 from each side of the equation. Divide each side of the equation by 3. x has a value of 8. If you wanted to double check that, you can plug it in. 3 times 8 is 24. You add 1, you get 25. So sure enough, mn has a value of 25, which is what the base is averaged. Number 14, once again, mid-segment mn has to be the average of the bases. One of the bases is x plus 1, the other base is 8x. Of course, mn is also a little bit sneaky. It's 5x minus 1, so I'll substitute that in there. Now I've got an equation with just one variable. Right? The only variable is letter x. Combine like terms on the numerator of the fraction. 
Now, I could decide to do the division with that fraction, but because 9 divided by 2 comes out as a decimal instead of a whole number, and 1 divided by 2 would come out as a decimal instead of a whole number, instead of doing the division, I'm going to decide to multiply both sides of the equation by 2. That will eliminate the fractions. Left-hand side, I've got to do the distributive property. 2 times 5x is 10x. 2 times 1 is 2. Of course, the subtraction symbol between the 5x and the 1, so I better have a subtraction symbol between the 10x and the 2. Right-hand side of the equation, multiplying by 2 is the opposite of dividing by 2, so the 9x plus 1 just sits there. Subtract 9x from each side. Add 2 to each side. Viola, x is 3. If you wanted to double-check that, you could plug it in for each base and the mid-segment. You'd find the bases have a length of 4 and 24. Of course, 4 and 24 average to be 14. And the mid-segment, if you plug in 3, sure enough, you get 14. Kites. Not a whole lot we can do with kites. We can play with the measurement of the angles a little bit. Because it's a quadrilateral, we know that that up to 360 degrees. I also know that angle E has to be congruent to angle G. And so I can make that change. Now I can substitute the values that I know. Combine like terms. Of course, I now have two of those measures of angle G. Subtract 144 from each side. Divide each side by 2. Again, notice that degree symbol is there in the answer because we're looking for the measurement of an angle. Number 16, extremely similar. That's kind of a weird border. Hmm. Looks like the cows are coming home. We must be getting near the end of this. Question 16, there are not too many left. You know the four angles have to add up to 360. Of course, you know angle E and angle G are congruent. So therefore, the measurements are equal, and I can do that substitution. Now I can substitute the values for angle F and angle H. Combine like terms. Subtract 230 degrees from each side of the equation. Divide by 2. And we get a lovely answer. The measure of angle G is 65 degrees. We're on the home stretch. The last two questions, number 17 and 18. Pythagorean theorem will come into play. 3 times 3 is 9. 4 times 4 is 16. 9 plus 16 is 25. But of course, I don't want the value of AB squared. I just want the value of AB. So I need to take the square root. How lucky can you get? It comes out to be exactly 5. That's pretty lucky if you ask me. Oh, wait a minute here. AB, because this is a kite, equals AD. That was a quick answer. AD is also 5. Again, the Pythagorean theorem. 4 times 4 plus 12 times 12 will be equal to BC times BC. Right, 4 squared plus 12 squared equals the value of BC squared. 4 times 4 is 16. 12 times 12, 144. Got to do a little bit of addition here. 160. Take the square root. Uh-oh. 
160 is not a perfect square. So the best thing I can do is 16 times 10. 16 is the largest perfect square that is a factor of 160. Hopefully this one was easy enough to eyeball. Tomorrow on the worksheet, there's going to be one where it may not be quite so easy to eyeball. And I'm going to show you a slightly different technique to figure out how to break it up. Square root of 16, of course, is just 4. Square root of 10, well, we're stuck with that. So that's as simple as it gets. But we're lucky. BC equals DC. Therefore, DC also has a value of 4 root 10. If that 4 root 10 could hurry up and get over there, we can get to the last question. And then when we get down to the last question, we can ride off into the sunset. Happy endings all seem to have that riding off the sunset. So let's get there. Holy cow. It looks like my best friend again is going to be the Pythagorean Theorem. Again, the reason why we can use the Pythagorean Theorem is with a kite, the diagonals meet at a right angle. And so that's why we can do this, right? Pythagorean Theorem can only be used if you have a right triangle. And we have right triangles because the diagonals meet perpendicularly. 5 times 5 is 25. 12 times 12 is 144. Combine like terms, I get 169. Now, this is probably not one you've got memorized because it's beyond 12 times 12 on the times table. But 13 times 13 does make 169. Of course, AB is also equal to AD. Therefore, AD also has to have a value of 13. Let's get our best friend, the Pythagorean Theorem, up here again. 9 times 9 is 81. 12 times 12 is 144. Those add up to 225. Again, 12 times 12 is only 144. So anytime we've got a number greater than 144, it's probably not one you've memorized. But we are quite lucky because when we take the square root of 225, it comes out to be just 15. And of course, if BC equals 15, DC will also equal 15. And we can happily ride off into the sunset. That's the 15 circles the cow. I don't know why it did that, but it did. Now we can ride off into the sunset. Very successful time with this worksheet. We'll do one more review tomorrow, and then you should be ready for a test the following day.